Thank you, everybody, for coming this afternoon. Uh, Jack, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, as I think I was mentioning to you just a few moments ago, uh, I've done this quite a few times, but this is the first time I've really been very nervous. So, uh, <laughs> and I, uh, I do this uh, fairly often, but uh, I have such great appreciation and awe for your accomplishments. So thank you so much, sir, for being here today. Uh, I, I, I want to just take a moment as a, as a personal moment uh, to just basically say to you, thank you for your service to our country, uh, serving as a, uh, uh, in World War II. And uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank you for your uh, most recent program entitled uh, Veteran Gifting Program. So thank you for your concern and thank you for your generosity in serving all of our veterans. And so that kind of seems like a very natural starting point. So I, I'm, I want to share something from your book that I've read, and I, I really enjoyed it. And thank you. I've learned a lot from your book. Uh, you say something uh, when the war was over to the group of men that you served with, and you said in your book, we had, uh, we had all been on one hell of a team. Without you, you tell the folks you served with, I could not have survived. And I want to thank each of you for always being there. And then you go on to say, looking back, I realize it was at that very moment that I started my career as an entrepreneur. And I'm wondering, uh, what, was, what was the takeaway? What was the lesson you wanted the reader to learn from that passage? Well, uh, first of all, Bonnie, uh, you're starting on a very emotional level for me. Uh, because when you go back in time and you realize uh, how things have come together, in part of our conversation, you say, well, in all of your negotiations and all your deals, did you ever experience fear? And I said, no, I don't. I didn't. I said, once you have been shot at, uh, losing a few bucks isn't going to make a well of a lot of difference. It's, it's, a different, it's a different ball game. And when I said that to my friends, these were the fellow of the crew. I was the navigator and radar bombardier. And there were 10 other guys uh, starting the pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, and so on. Uh, and if any one of us had not done our job right, I would not be here today. So uh, it starts, you know, I, I don't usually get emotional like that, but it just starts on a very, a very emotional level. I, I uh, it, it ties in, it's, and it's part of my thinking with regard to veterans. We have a lot of guys out there, and women, who now are going to come back into civilian life, and the job market is tough, and what are they trained for? Well, I can tell them, as I've told them in the book, and as I have told them in speeches that I've given and in person, that the discipline that they received in the, in, in the service uh, is one huge advantage because a good business is disciplined. It can't be just wild. It's, it, there has to be a lot of discipline to it. In order to be successful, it, 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 you don't have to have a brilliant mind, but you do have to have a disciplined mind. You have to uh, be able to, 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 to make a plan and follow it and, and go through with it. So uh, that was it. I'm also overwhelmed with the attendance. I'm, I'm thrilled with it. I'm, I'm delighted I, uh, because it's also one of my ambitions now. It, uh, it, funny thing to say ambition, I just celebrated my 90th birthday last month. <laughs> and uh, that it, it's, it, it's so good to see the interest in entrepreneurship and the understanding, because if my 
vantage point as I see things that the uh, economic welfare and therefore the social and therefore the living uh, in this country is vastly improved if we have more entrepreneurs because times have changed rapidly. Every time there's something else has been obsoleted, something else has come up. Uh, and and to, to understand that, uh, that the growth, in my opinion, is going to come from the entrepreneurs. It's no longer going to come from the research and development departments of the major corporations because that money's long gone into the stockholders' equity. The, 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 the main drive is, is that more than 60% of the jobs come from small business. 75% uh, uh, of the market for American merchandise is outside the continental limits of the United States. And there is so much that we can learn uh, that makes us more effective. And I've been fortunate enough to be on, on this trip. You know, I compare it to a football game. The first quarter, you sort of learn what you're doing and you sharpen your skills and you find what your weaknesses and what your strengths are. The second and third quarter, you're in there playing the game and really, really, really going at it and making everything work for you. And uh, the fourth quarter, you've got to say, now what do I do best and what can I leave? And... Uh, uh, I, 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 I am in the fourth quarter. In fact, I think I'm on the two-minute drill. <laughs> I'm looking for overtime. All right, Jack. Uh, <laughs> Let me just say you are a wonderful example, and I understand now why we call yours the greatest generation, for sure. Um, you... Uh, Get out of the service. I think you're in your early 20s, and you uh, you have a high school education, and you jump right into a business venture. And one of the things that struck me in your book is you said, uh, growing up in New York, uh, you grew up learning street smarts. And what I'd like to know is, what does that mean to you? And what is what do you think that means for our young entrepreneurs today? Uh... If I were to give a short definition of street smarts, it's learning how to think on your feet. Because if you don't think on your feet, someone's going to come off and put you on your ass. <laughs> so you, 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 you really, you really have, to, have to learn that. When I started, I knew I wanted to go into business. I, I, I never heard the word entrepreneur. I don't think it was invented yet. See, uh, and, and, and getting in into business was, was, was what I wanted to do. I, had, uh, I, I joined the uh, Army Air Corps uh, the day after my 19th birthday in 1942, and I was discharged honorably in, uh, in 1946. So after all those years of taking orders, I wanted to start giving them. <laughs> you know, I, I felt that I had learned enough. I had learned enough. And there was one thing in the Air Force that they used to teach you is because everybody in the cadet program uh, became a commissioned officer that you had to learn to take orders before you could give them. So uh, the, 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 I hit the ground running. Uh, I had an older brother who was three years older than I we, we started a company called Trans-Pacific Traders. Uh, we, uh, we found out a big, big un undercover operation. Uh, it was published in the Chamber of Commerce newspaper that the Chinese were looking for navy blue. There was a Chinese contingent looking for navy blue material, navy blue woolen material. I didn't know it then, but it was for the army of Chiang Kai-shek. And, uh, and, and I said, well, let's do that. Well, lo and behold, there was no Navy Blue Wool material. We just, during the war, they just didn't manufacture it. And, but there was a lot of Army olive drip that was for sale. 
It didn't take, we weren't rocket scientists, we figured it out. We'd buy the olive drab, dye it navy, and sell it to the Chinese. <laughs> and you know what? It worked. <laughs> <laughs> and incidentally, because my friends at Union Bank are here, I, I have to, it's, 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 it's really an honest plug. The, when I went to finance it, here we had a multi-million dollar deal in 1946. Uh, and no money, and how do you finance it? And uh, I went to the Foreign Trade Department, and I re even remember the man's name, Leo Halferberger, who took me under his wings, taught me all about letters of credit and, and how uncomplicated they could be if you do them correctly, and that's what I did, and, and we financed it, and everything went as smooth as silk. And that's kind of amazing that here we are, what, 67 years later, and we're talking about it. That's a wonderful story, Jack. It's just uh, the opportunity seemed so obvious, but yet so few saw it. So I, I wonder, you know, what kinds of things in uh, your early days as you were in fully engaged in Jack Nadell International, what kinds of things did you pay attention to? What, what are the things that were on your radar screen? Well, I think the first thing, and I don't know where I got it from, but the, the idea was I felt that our company had to be different, had to perform more than any other company in, the, in, in, in that arena, that uh, that was a, uh, a business at the time that sold advertising calendars and advertising specialties and business gifts. And they were, uh, the main company uh, uh, boasted that, of remembrance advertising. And what I did was I said, no, we are an advertising media. By using this merchandise properly, you can get business. I can bring traffic into your door the next day. So I coined the phrase, ideas that mean business. And that became the, slo the slogan for our company. The, uh, uh, if, you, if you want something f to be remembered by, they're the guys for you. But if you, want, uh, if you want traffic in your trade show, call Jack Nadell. So w w do you think you were an insightful salesman that could share that skill with your clients, or were you a marketing genius that people uh, didn't see these opportunities and you were able to see? I know well, I leave, I leave the word genius. Uh, it, it does not apply to me. Uh, genius, uh, genius would be... Uh, uh, Having a successful uh, company 60 uh, years later would be uh, genius, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, of course, that, that, that was, that, there was a lot that went into that because that tiny office that we had where my late wife and I would work, if someone came in, one of us had to go out. Uh, there just wasn't room. <laughs> and... Uh, Today, 60 years later, there's 25 offices around the world. Uh, so it takes a, 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 an understanding. It, it takes the ability to listen. It is down, down strange. But the idea of selling depends on your ability to listen. Because if I listen to you and I hear what your problem is, I have a better shot at coming up with a solution to it than as somebody who came in and all he's thinking of is what he's got to sell you. So uh, the trick is, it's, it's no trick, is that very quickly you get from the uh, we and them to we because now we're on the same side of the desk trying to solve the same problem. Uh, so it's a question of, uh, of really, really uh, understanding what you're trying to do and then applying it and uh, uh, remembering, I, 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 I said at that time, you know, all business is personal. And that sounds strange. That was in the day where IBM said everything was automatic and everything 
worked. And uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I got the, 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 the point that I wanted to make originally was that the genius of the world is guys like Steve Jobs, who create an entire industry that never existed before. My appeal to you and to all the students is that we're not Steve Jobs. We're men and women with a discipline and with a desire to win and with a desire to work and desire to, to get things done. And, and uh, that's, what we're, that's, that's what the entrepreneurial section of the United States consists of, mm -hmm. is, is that willingness to go out and take a chance. Of course. And, and you know, what's, what's interesting, Jack, is that you, you mentioned in your book and you mentioned here already tonight that uh, when you left the service, one of the things that was a priority was that you didn't want to take orders anymore, that you, you wanted to give orders. And, and yet at the same time, you talk about the importance of the team of the people that you worked with uh, as on that aircraft. And I'm wondering, how, how, do, how do you view yourself and your leadership style? Uh, did you uh, did you build strong relationships with the people that worked in your organization? I think everything that we're talking about is about relationships. You establish a relationship to do business. You establish a relationship in your personal life. You you it's your relationship that gives you the e-ticket to do whatever makes sense for 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 everybody involved. So. Uh, there's, I was taught that incidentally by my uh, Japanese friends, and this is kind of interesting, uh, is that uh, uh, through all the years I did the export and import and meetings and uh, creating new products and putting them on the market and testing them and doing all the things that you're supposed to do, that... Uh, in 1988, there was a, uh, uh, we were having a tough time and Japan was riding very high and uh, uh, President Reagan appointed me to a trade mission to Japan. Now, I don't know how he found me because I was a Democrat. <laughs> uh, but it proves again that what we should be doing in this world is finding the people that are best suited for it, forget what their political affiliations are, is get the best person for the job all the time. Because we did it, we did a great job, but the lesson that I learned was that in a conference with uh, Mitsubishi and, and, and Sony, uh, I said something about making a deal, and uh, the president of Mitsubishi said, uh, uh, See, that's the problem with Americans. You come over here, you want to make a deal. We want to, we Japanese want to establish a relationship so that we have the basis for making many deals. I never, I never forgot that. It's an important lesson. And, and I think it also lends itself, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have this sense that entrepreneurs are these uh, lone rangers in a sense, that they do everything on their own, and the reality is, I think, correct me again if I'm wrong, Jack, but when you talk about relationships, you're talking about building those relationships with people that will facilitate your success, that you can't do it on your own, is that correct? Absolutely, the days of the Lone Ranger are over. Uh, incidentally, box office shows that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then the last picture, but the, 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 the I, I considered myself a Lone Ranger. I went out, I did everything. You know, I, I'd sweep the floor if I had to. I did whatever I had to do to make the deal. But uh, today, it really takes a team. And I think that's one of the places where Jack Daniel International has been especially adept, is, is to put together a team. Because you not only are talking about uh, selling something, distributing something, driving traffic somewhere, but there's all the logistics that go behind it. So it really, in order, to, in order to do something that really has some meaning, you do need a team. Now, it's very simple today. 
What's simple about it is that, and, and what I've been advocating, is that we are all independent people. And today, if you want to go into business, you don't have to go find an office and, 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 and hire a bunch of people and put up a factory. It's all out there. And, and they're ready and, and, and willing to freelance people who will do what they're supposed to do, who, who will get properly paid for it and become part of the team the same way. It's, uh, uh, it's just a little different structure. When I first started, we, we, we had to find an office because there was no such thing as working in a home office. If you're a home office, you were, you were nothing. You, you, just, you just didn't count. But that's not the case today. Today, uh, you do, but now you have to put together, and it's even better, the best team possible to do the job you want to do. Because what we've learned from Google and, 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 and from uh, Microsoft and from uh, all, all this, uh, YouTube and all the search engines is that the great amount of money and the great amount of action is to understand that we're all individuals. So it's not important, for example, in the old days, if you had a hit television show and, you, and 50 million people saw it. The question is, what are you selling, and how many of those 50 million could afford to buy what you're selling? If you were, if you were advertising Rolls Royce on it, uh, you, you, you're only hitting a, a small percentage of the market. So today's economy is more specialized, and it's so much easier because of the search engines and because the things that you have to learn about a company, you can find out on your computer. It's, uh, uh, the, the biggest question has always been, it, was there more opportunity when you did it, or was there more opportunity now? Well, there was a lot of opportunity when I did that. We were re rebuilding a world that had been bombed and destroyed, and, that, and the and whole cities and countries had to be rebuilt. But in today, you can reach into every nook and cranny of the world in 10 seconds. And it took me three weeks to get a sample of a piece of material to China in 1946. Today, it's there overnight. And if I'm sending a, a virtual, it's there in seconds. So it, it's not a question as which is better. What are we living with today? And what market are we in today? And what I tried to do in my book was to, in giving tips, I would give an anecdote of something that happened in my career, and uh, a lot of which I don't print. But uh, what happened in, 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 in my career, but then I also go to the headlines and see what happened yesterday that says that idea is right, it works. Thank you, Jack, which leads, I think, very nicely to my next question. Uh, you, you talk about uh, learning from your mistakes in your book, and you would uh, simply say, I would ask myself, um, what did I do to make my venture go bad? And then you continue on and you say, all the indications were there, I just did not do my research. Uh, for these budding entrepreneurs or small business owners today who are in business, what kind of information do you think they need to be looking at? Because from a marketing standpoint, what are the kinds of things that they should be paying attention to and researching? Well, I, I, I put it down in very simple terms. When I sat down to, to, to write this book, the, it was, what would I look for if I were starting? Uh, and uh, in the first several pages is something that I call the method. It's five points that you have to do before you go into business, before you spend them any money, uh, before you knock yourself out, and do your own research and follow these five points. Clearly, it's one, decide to do something that you love to do. You should not do anything you hate. Uh, to me, this past 68 years has been a ball. 
I have enjoyed every minute of it. I can't remember a boring day at the office because I've always done something I wanted to do. If I was working in France, I wanted to be in France. And if I was working in China, I wanted to be in China. So I had all the, all, all of the, the privileges of doing that. That's the first point. Uh, the second point is now take your idea and do some research. Who else is doing what you are uh, what you are contemplating, what you think you can do, and and check it out because they they really come to the realization that most often, if you have a good idea, someone says, "Gee, it's so simple. Someone should have thought of it before." Usually they did. Somebody thought of it before. Who's doing it? How are they doing it? Are they making money at it? Uh, are they rendering the best possible service? If they are doing it, what can I do that's better? or they can be more important. And then the third part of it is to sit down and write a business plan. And this business plan is very important with a timeline and uh, putting in all the ingredients that you need with people, with research, with uh, finances, which, uh, with whatever it takes. And then, do the, then go into the business and you know what you're doing and perform and of course, when, once you perform and you've done it right, and it works, uh, start the next deal. I mean, it just it just works as simply as that. But I have seen I have seen really someone came to me with an idea for a computer program, uh, and 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 I said that idea is fabulous. I said, is any is anybody else doing? He said, of course not. I said, what do you mean, of course not? He said, I checked it. There's nobody else doing it. So I said, okay. Uh, it turned out he had already raised over three quarters of a million dollars and was looking for more. But he hadn't made one dollar in profit yet. Uh, so I, five minutes after he left, I went to my computer and I found seven people doing the same thing. I mean, that is where you fall apart. Uh, let me put it on myself. <laughs> the biggest mistake I made, uh, big, I've, uh, I have to really go through a bunch of them, but <laughs> the biggest mistake I made was when we decided to open up a pen factory in Europe, and we chose Italy. And we opened the factory in Italy. And I, I described doing business in Italy as like living in a grand opera. <laughs> I mean, every, everything is going at the same time. I love Italy, I love the Italian, I love their style, but boy, it was, it was not the right place. One day in, in, in Milano, in a very dismal cold day, and I'm shivering in the plant, uh, I get a call and say, I'm breaking the law. I said, I didn't know it was against the law to lose money. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the law in Italy is that you have to have at least 20% disabled people, and uh, there was some other thing, I forget which. Anyway, it made it, made it untenable. It couldn't be done. Uh, and, of course, I really had to be, come back with a smart, smart, wise crack and say, well, the last time I oh, oh yeah, you had a, I had I had 25% veterans. I said, well, the last time Italy lost the war was in 1943, and that didn't go over too well. <laughs> and, and so finally, I did, I did leave Italy. I love Italy. I go back time, time and again, but it, it's not a place that, that I should have been. The, the, the bank rates were wrong. The government was wrong. Everything was wrong. I found a place in the south of France that was perfect. And, and it was very successful. But we started out losing a lot of money first. So what was the most important lesson then that you walked away from as a result of that experience? The research has to be to, uh, to, to totally investigate the arena in which you're going to operate, make sure that it is set up so that you can operate, make sure that you have a, a reasonably friendly uh, government that you can work with, 
Uh, and, you know, it was excluded me from all the places in the world where business depends on graft. I, you, know, you, you, can't, you can't work in that. Sure. So the, the first good research, that because the, I, I love the, the Italian people that, that, that I worked with were great. Uh, we became great friends, but it just, it, it just couldn't work because of the setup. And, and in France, it just had to work because of the setup at that time. I, I want to go back to something you said just a moment ago, too, Jack, because I want to hammer down on that a little bit more for the benefit of our audience tonight. You said that go into business and do something that you love or that it's fun, and, and I like that. I, I hear that a lot from a lot of very successful entrepreneurs like yourself. My question to you is, should the motivation for an entrepreneur be to do something that they love and have fun, or should the motivation be, I'm doing this to make money? Yes. <laughs> uh, the, the best example I have of a happy entrepreneur at, at the time, uh, aside from myself, uh, is my wife. Uh, and there she is. Stand up, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> Julie and I met 11 years ago uh, this week, 11 years ago. And uh, uh, we, hit it, we, 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 we hit it off just great. But when I heard her background, that she... Uh, had been divorced and uh, had two young children and uh, didn't uh, get a huge, a huge settlement, if any, uh, and went out and she loved, loved food. She loved cooking and she's very gregarious and very entertaining. So she entered the catering and party planning business. So she was the uh, party plus in, in the former for, for life. She did a great job. She did the Super Bowl. She did uh, um, uh, the, the uh, Olympics. Uh, and she did a lot of celebrity weddings. The wonderful thing about her celebrity weddings, of which there were many, every one of them, it's a perfect, perfect uh, scorecard. Every one of them are divorced today. <laughs> so is, is Julie's story and your story based that you pursued something that you loved, yes. but you stuck with it or did it because it made you money as well? Yes, again. Uh, uh, the, the thing is called a living, Correct. and whatever you define as a living, uh, 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 I, uh, speaking for myself, uh, I have never, from the day I started my company, I have never looked backwards, I have never worried about finances. That's a very big thing to say, and, and, and I can't, nobody appreciates that more than I do. But I, I've, I've just enjoyed it so much, but at the same time, I've enjoyed everything about it. I've I enjoyed the, 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 you know, one of the kids in a class in Santa Barbara, I, I used to teach here, here once in a while, uh, asked, when do you feel that you've made enough money? I said, well, I feel I've made enough money when I can go anywhere I want, anytime I want, and travel first class. After that, it's just numbers. And that's, and that's what's worked for me. So it is, it is, it is the making of, uh, of the money. Now, now, now I have the, the other end of it. I, I have been fortunate enough to make enough money that I'm in, in, in the other end of, of, of giving back. And there is where I think is, is, is the fourth quarter really is important, that, that you pass 
something on. And what I'd like to do, and the reason I, you and I are sitting here, and the reason that we go through this, is that I would like to have everybody that can take advantage of what I have learned. And the reason I started to write was because my words will be forgotten in a month, but what I've put down on paper is going, is going to last. So I, I expect anybody can go to it, can refer to it, and long after I've, I, I, I am no longer here, uh, they're, they're benefiting from what, from, what, uh, from what I've said because I, uh, I, I believe I've been fortunate enough to, to give the straight facts on, on, uh, on, on there's no formula. It, it changes for each of us. And that's, uh, that's what I'm so, so uh, keen on is that you've got to keep your individuality that uh, people, <laughs> uh, people used to say to me, well, uh, incidentally, not even digressing, but I think the most fun I had was when I had the company all by myself and I just did anything I wanted to do. And now I've got more people. I don't, I'm not even active. But I think the smartest thing I did then was 20 years ago at the age of 70, I retired from active work and devoted myself to uh, writing and teaching traveling, and just having a good time. Well, we appreciate yeah. you spending time with us today, Jack, for sure. We have been talking in our entrepreneurship program and in some of my business classes about product development. And you say something, again, in your book that uh, reads, thousands of people come up with millions of ideas, but they have nothing until they've proven that an idea can work. And so based on your experience, what does it take to prove that an idea can work for you? By proving it. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds flip, but it isn't. Uh, you could take one of two forms. You can be, uh, you, you may have created a product. And you think the product is great. And you think it can fit a certain area and you can make a profit. Don't ever leave the word profit out of it. Profit is a very good word. Uh, and, and, and you can profit, profit by it. Uh, you test it. Uh, we were in the direct mail business. We tested things before, before we would roll out to a million piece mailing or something. We would test 50,000 pieces and see what came back. If it's a product, I will make a handmade sample and sell from that before I start to produce anything. Uh, we were manufacturing ballpoint pens and I had an idea. Uh, the highlighter had just come out and it was very popular. And I said, well, why don't I take the highlighter and put it on the other end of my ballpoint pen? Then it serves two purposes. It's the writing and the highlighting. And I made some samples, and uh, uh, after I'd sold about a quarter of a million of them, I started to manufacture it. So the uh, proof for you then really is the sale. Yeah, because you never know what's going to happen in between. Kind of a, a, a sad story that just came up recently was... Uh, uh, I had an idea. I was working on the uh, uh, Robert Kennedy uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. and I was very active on it. And I came up with an idea to make gold-plated bobby pins uh, that they could sell to finance the campaign, to help finance the campaign. And I did. I made a half a dozen samples. And of course, you know what happened, history. Uh, Bobby was assassinated. But last year, I got a call from someone who said, I'd like to buy some of those bobby pins that you make. I said, I don't make bobby pins. 
He said, oh, no, 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 we saw the sample. Well, believe it or not, one of those six samples I had made for Bob Kennedy wound up in the Smithsonian. And that's where she saw it. So the, there's, no, there's no way to call it, but the good business is, is don't fall in love with your idea. Be ready to change your mind. I've had products that I, that I prop didn't care for, didn't think would sell, went out and sold a ton and made a lot of money on them. Suddenly, I like them. <laughs> <laughs> You go on to say and provide what I think is really incredible advice that you should plan your business around the market that is instead of the market you wish existed. So yeah. is there a, a, a secret here, a process for identifying a market that you used or you would recommend? Well, I, I say that uh, you, the market becomes pretty evident. As, as, as you're there. Uh, and today, the idea of creating businesses has been an end in itself many times. Uh, young people go to college, want to come up with a new computer program, come up with it and maybe sell it to one of the venture capitalists and, 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 and on and on from there. That's a different type of thing. That's someone saying, I want to make something so clever that someone's going to give me $10 million for it or $100 million or whatever the case may be. And, and it, it, it's happened. It's happened over and over again. I mean, the, the headlines, uh, Twitter just went public. Right. You know, a, a huge, huge thing without having... It, it breaks all the rules of the business world because it, they have no profit. Are they right? Are they wrong? I don't know. I don't know. But mine is the old-fashioned thing is saying, what is there and what do you find in need? Well, what is an opportunity? Uh, I have a young fellow I've been working with who, who, who uh, is in the landscape architect. He's, he takes care of gardens and stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he does very nicely, but he says, you know, it's, it's constant hassle. Either he's working and, or he's looking for work, or, and they lose him and he gets him. I said, why don't you put out a product? And what do you mean? I said, well, uh, I know uh, in, in, in our house we have rabbits. They're not welcome. <laughs> I really don't want them. They got so brazen that when Julie and I would leave, they'd stand there and wave goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so what he is doing now is, is putting out a line of repellents. I said, I don't want to kill him. I just want to tell him, don't, 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 visit. don't, don't be there. Right. And that goes for squirrels, too, and you know, other, other, other animals. And... Uh, uh, and the reason I happen to talk about it now, he called me just last night. He's got his first samples, and he's going to a trade show, and he's already sold several thousand packages. So uh, he said, he said what, is, what, what is the moral? I said, the moral is that now you can make money while you sleep. Awesome. Which is true. It's great advice. Uh, I want to shift a little bit, if I can, Jack. Uh, you and Julie were kind enough to have uh, Melissa and I, and I out to your home about a week or so ago, and you are both just wonderful, kind people, and we thank you for that. And you strike me as a as a gentleman in all that you do and a very kind man. But in reading your book, in a negotiation, you struck me as a real bulldog, that you weren't going to go into a negotiation unprepared and that you weren't going to walk into a negotiation and accept the conditions unless they seemed to your advantage. Might I say to everybody in business, you should never go into a meeting that you're not prepared. Never, ever. There is no excuse. Can't postpone the meeting if you're not prepared, but don't go into the meeting unprepared. I, go, I used to go through a very painstaking process 
I would visualize the meeting in my head like a screen above my head. And I would say something and the other guy would say something and I would say something back. And I, I somehow knew what they were gonna say and I knew then what I was gonna say. And at the end of the day, when I went to the meeting, I felt like I was going for the second time, that I already qualified it. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think you can prepare too much for an important meeting. Uh, and, uh, and you can't, and, and the important thing always, you know, once more, you, you, rules change. Uh, when they were writing books about motivation, they say, go in, get friendly, talk about your golf game, talk about women, talk about... And I trained my entire sales force always. I want you to talk about, I want you to, everything you say should conclude with a sale. What you're talking about should be con a concluding in a sale. That's what you're there for. And uh, I... I think in today's, in today's world, people appreciate that more, that you don't take their time with uh, unnecessary conversation or chatter, but always trying to serve a, a client or an account so that what you're putting out is going to benefit him. And he doesn't care, really how much it benefits you, which is fine. Right. Yeah. So as a business relationship, because you, you mentioned that everything starts with a relationship, and I really love that advice. So is a business relationship really based upon meeting the needs of the client, or does it go beyond that for you? I think it goes beyond that. I think it, it's, it's meeting the need of the client it's, uh, it's understanding what, what, what they're doing. I had a, I, I, I'll never forget, I couldn't even figure this out. Uh, I, I, I was uh, uh, one year the chairman of the uh, uh, association, the Promo Promotional Products Association International. And I gave a speech in Dusseldorf, Germany, to 2,000 Germans who and they had the, the first time I ever spoke with notes, <laughs> you know, uh, and because I had to follow the script that was going on over my head. But when I came out, I made two of the greatest friends I had in my life. And they came from Belgium. And uh, uh, one day, several years later, I had a real big, big problem in my French office and uh, I called uh, Van Bavel, that was his name, uh, and uh, I told him about it. He says, I'll, I'll be down there next, tomorrow. Well, it was a pretty good trip from Antwerp to Cannes. So, uh, okay, the next morning he calls me he said, every plane was booked, so I'm driving. Wow. So that's based on that relationship. On, and that, uh, on a relationship. Relationship. Based on a relationship, yes. And, and we couldn't have been further apart in the world. He, mm -hmm. he ate like he could eat this whole room. <laughs> uh, if you've ever been in Belgium, the, Portions are very hearty, <laughs> and and uh, uh, he smokes cigars incessantly, and but the guy was true all the way through. He he came down and he really helped me in a situation where I was having a great deal of difficulty, and he did it purely on a friendship. A powerful lesson in the importance of relationships, Jack. Thank you. Um, shifting just a little bit again, Jack, one of the things I ask students to do in my classes at the beginning of a semester is to write a statement of purpose. I really challenge them to think about why they're here, why they're going to college. 
What do you think? What, what's the purpose of an education for these young people? What, what's your advice? Boy, that, that you is offer? really that is really a good question because that has changed so dramatically. Uh, when I started, uh, they had the GI Bill of Rights, which I could have gone to any school, uh, and I, I had thought of going into some uh, some things, but. Uh, artistic uh, in, in the writing and acting and directing arena, but I decided I, I, I wanted to be a, a, in, in business. Uh, but the the choice was they we can make the, the choice that we want. Today the economic conditions realistically, uh, students wind up with too big a debt. If they want to get a full four-year education, they wind up, what, $100,000, $200,000 behind the eight ball. And it's very, very difficult. I have to think of what it really takes to make in today's world. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you don't need a four-year college education, in my opinion. The, the uh, someone asked me, because I, my, my first, uh, skill set, if you will, was I was reputed to be a hell of a salesman. Uh, uh, and, uh, and someone asked me, how do you teach somebody to sell? I said, send them out and make them sell. <laughs> You've got to do it. You've got to do it. You've got to get your feet wet. Uh, if, if, if you're going into business and you like to be stress-free, Forget it. Go somewhere else. Uh, uh, do bird watching. Uh, uh, there's, there's, there is no such thing as business without stress. It's there. It's part of. It's part of it. In fact, one of the titles I thought of was "Stress to Success." <laughs> That's a great title. You might want to put a trademark copyright on that for sure. Uh, Jack, I want to be very careful in reading this because, it, it, to me, it's a very, very powerful statement you make in your book. And then I have a short question I want to ask you in relationship to this. You say, I would never value my present and future against the past. Like anything important, a new attitude does not immediately spring to life, but it evolves at its own pace. I just want you to know that meant a great deal to me, and, and I read that to my parents, and it meant a great deal to them. My question to you is, how do you think a person's attitude affects in the workplace, in an entrepreneurial venture in their lives, how does that affect their morale and their performance and their commitment to the purpose that they're pursuing? The attitude is huge. Uh, it's just as I started out with the analogy of a football game, uh, I, I made the statement in the National Football League on any given day, any team can beat any other team. I don't care if, who is on the other team. It's, uh, it's a question of desire, it's a question of uh, uh, motivation, and uh, uh, the coach, the coach has to really be a motivator, has to really be a prime motivator. And attitude is, is what it's all about. Uh, your attitude uh, is, and, and this is one of my pet things is, uh, people have heard me say it, uh, that in many cases they say, well, this is right or this is wrong. And I'd say, there, there is no right or wrong. I mean, right or wrong, two plus two is four is right. Two plus two is four is five is wrong. But if you're talking about your attitude, your morality, uh, your, 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 your background, your, uh, there is no right and there is no wrong. Uh, I think everybody has to follow their own, their own lead. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it was, what was it, uh, Shakespeare that said, uh, this above all to thine own self be true. Thank you. Um, what, what did you have to give up to get to this point in your life in terms of your business experience? Poverty. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> no. <laughs> That's a great answer. No, I, I, of course, you, 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 always, you always give up something when you take something else. Nothing is 100%. It's 90-10, it's 60-40, but it's never 100%. Uh, when I think of what I have had to give up, I really, I really can't think of anything except in retrospect. I, I think uh, in, in the early days of my career, I was a working dynamo. I mean, I, I was going 24 hours a day. Uh, I could fly to, to, to France and have a meeting at the airport and then take a plane to, uh, to, to Nice and uh, have another meeting and so on. And I, if I say I gave up anything, I gave up time at home that, that people today are much more aware of. Uh, I know uh, my son is here, and he will vouch for that. Uh, I did not spend enough hours at home, and, I, and, I, and that, was, that, was, that was it. What I gave up personally, I really, I really can't think of a thing that I, I really wanted to do in, in my entire lifetime that I have not done. So that's the, uh, uh, that's why I'm very, uh, I have a very, I, I, I really want to one day talk to people about how, how, how you treat older people and what they're going through and what, what, what problems they have. My, I had a very dear friend who was one of the most prominent attorneys in Washington, D.C., and he was just dynamite. We had a lot of fun together, and we laughed and traveled and did all kinds of things. Uh, but when he got older and he got sick, uh, I said, well, Bob, why don't you do something else? He says, you don't know how lucky you are. You, you do whatever you feel you want to do. You want to write, you write. You want to teach, you teach. I, I, can only, I'm, I only know the law. So he had to find uh, another, another outlet, another place, another passion that was other than what he'd been doing all his life. And, and too many people are without that. When Republic uh, Corporation acquired Jack Nadell International, at the end of that negotiation, you were asked to write a business plan. And you indicated that you wrote that business plan in a week. And that's a pretty remarkable feat. I'm just wondering, what was in that plan? And, and why do you, think, do you think it's possible to write a business plan in a week? Or do we make that process too formal? Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, and, and, and obviously, I, I, I did. But I, I had a unique situation. Uh, I sold the company to a, a company on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, and it involved, without getting details, uh, exchange of stock, and uh, uh, it became evident after about almost a year of real prosperity where the stock doubled, uh, it started to go downhill and was going downhill very fast. And you could see what was happening. The, those days of the conglomerate or the theory that one person could run a company that did 500 different things in 500 different places just doesn't, just, 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 just didn't work. So uh, uh, first I gave, I gave them a plan where I would put together the uh, advertising and sales promotion arms of which there were six or seven companies mm -hmm. and, and, and merge them. And I would run the whole thing and I could do it profitably. And then they said, that's exciting. Let's see if we can then sell that to, to raise money for the parent company. So I said, fine. And uh, when there was no buyers right away, I said, I gotta tell you what, I'll buy it. And they said, well, you'll buy it with what? I said, how much do you want? And we went through into negotiation, and I did, which was 
very rarely heard of at that time. I did a leverage buyout where the bank paid paid the money and uh, and we we wound up with with the company. So there was the answer to the simple question was like three different business plans. One followed the other. And I think the point is, which is very good, is if something isn't working, one of the, my prime rules is be able to change it, to turn around on a dime. Change your plan. If it ain't gonna work, don't 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 beat it. Change it. And that's what I did in that case. And that that came out very well. That really came out very well because I wound up then having a conglomerate of marketing companies and expanded into the European market. I, I noticed that in your book. Again, I, I would call that genius myself. Um, Jack, uh, it's, it's been a tremendous honor being here with you tonight and sharing your story and sharing your insights. I, I want to end our conversation this evening with, again, something that you said that I think needs to be said so that everyone can hear. You say, you'll never lose anything by sharing your ideas and secrets for excellence. You'll only deepen your relationships and give back to the world in important ways. I'd just like to say that your visit tonight, you sharing your experience, you sharing yourself. My sister likes to say the greatest gift a person can give is of themselves and of their time. And we really thank you. So on behalf of Santa Barbara City College, the Scheinfeld Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Small Business Development Center, and all of the students and uh, community members here tonight, thank you so much for sharing with us your story tonight. Thank you. Jack. I'd like to say just one word. I, I am deeply grateful to you and to everybody here to carry on this idea of sharing. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, this will lead to more, more of a movement towards a closer examination of the curriculum for, for entrepreneurship and uh, for a quicker result and a more satisfactory result and a better, because if we have more entrepreneurs, I'm gonna say it over and over again until I, I guess, until I can't say it anymore. The more entrepreneurs we have, the more businesses we have, the more independence, all these safety nets are down. You can't call, you can't count on the big institutions anymore. You've got to count on yourself and this is the healthiest thing I could think of doing. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. So, Jack, we have uh, just a, a quick little, um, one little surprise and an award to give you. Um, we'd like to invite Senator Hannah Beth Jackson to come up for uh, just a minute. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Jack, when I heard that you were gonna be get, getting this award, I was so excited. I've been following you and Julie and the enormously uh, helpful work that you've done in this community, not only with your writings, not only throughout the, the country, inspiring people to entrepreneurship, but your generosity. The combination of things that you do is just extraordinary. And so it gives me enormous uh, joy, and I feel enormously honored to present you with a certificate of recognition in honor of not only your lifelong achievements, your inspirational story, uh, the kindness that you have uh, shown our community, your largesse, the, the, the work you do to help others, the work you do to inspire the young people who are here and throughout the country. It's my honor and privilege to recognize you for this entrepreneurial lifetime Notable Achievement Award, the first one. It couldn't go to a more deserving person. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wish I could get up and say thank you, by the way. Thank you.
And now to present our first ever um, Elna Award, I want to introduce to you Elna Scheinfeld, who is the wife of the late James D. Scheinfeld, who means so much to me and the Scheinfeld Center. Thank you, Elna. So we're going to have Elna present to Jack our first ever Elna Award. And if I can do this right, thank goodness your first name is only four letters. <laughs> because Elna stands for Entrepreneurial Lifetime Notable Achievement. Well, this says exactly what Melissa already has said. And Jack, I've known you for what you have done with the visiting, nur visiting nurse and hospice care work and the music therapy that you and your wife established, yes. as, a, as well as what you've done with City College, which is only a small part of everything. But I'm so proud that you're going to be doing this, and Jim would be delighted. And I'm sure he's watching and enjoying this also. Congratulations, and Thanks. I'm so glad to hear your talk and what you think. And that parallels the ideas that Jim had, too. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Elna. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it and how much it means to me and how much of a vindication it is. And knowing you and your husband from way back there, it means even that much more. Thank you so much.